guy that's held a number of front office positions with the Buffalo Bills, Carolina Panthers, the Colts, building up to his experience before getting his opportunity in 2013 to become a GM in the league. We're delighted to welcome the general manager of the Los, An- of the Los Angeles Chargers, Tom Telesco. Tom, it's, a, it's an honor to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. This is a really interesting interview. Never done one like this before. Thank you very much. And look, Tom, we, we ask everyone this, right? You know, like I think we sort of had a conversation off camera there, but have you any Irish heritage? Uh, have you been to Ireland before? I believe you may have some uh, heritage on your wife's side of your family. Yeah, not, not on my side, but my wife's side. My, my wife, her maiden name is Connolly. So that one's a pretty easy one to figure out, right? So um, yeah, so she's Irish. Um, she has not been to Ireland. I've not been to Ireland. Um, I'm pretty sure her parents have. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's to the extent of that. Although, and here's my other one. Although, really, so I grew up in Buffalo, and um, my dad is Italian, uh, but he grew up in South Buffalo. And South Buffalo is it, it pretty much is the same way. It's it's heavily Irish, very big Irish neighborhood in South Buffalo. My dad was the only Italian I think in the whole the whole neighborhood. Um, but that's that's the way he grew up there. Um, we've had uh, the good fortune to have Jim Kelly on, and uh, he has some great stories about the the Irish in uh, in Buffalo. And um, yeah. yep. but I think the, the Irish and the Italians, they, we've all, we've always gotten along, and um, we're delighted to to welcome you, um, Tom. I suppose look reflecting on your time with the Colts, like 98, 2012, 154 wins, twelve playoff appearances eight division titles, two Super Bowl appearances, a victory over the, the Bears in Super Bowl 41. I mean, it was it's absolutely incredible right there. How formative was your time there? Uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm so grateful and lucky for that experience. Um, yeah, so I had, I had three years with the Carolina Panthers when, when Bill Pulling was there, and then 15 years with the Colts. But um, really, everything I learned in scouting and building a roster and really just how to be a general manager, which is, you know, a big job. It's not just a scouting job. Um, you know, I learned from Bill Pullian and his son, Chris Pullian, um, really at the Colts over that 15 year span. Um, and uh, obviously having a, you know, we had a hall of fame GM with Bill. We had a hall of fame coach with Tony Dungy. And then after Tony, we also had um, Jim Caldwell. And then obviously we had Peyton Manning and, you know, Edger and James and Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison, and Dwight Freeney. And so a lot of great players, um, but uh, yeah, I learned a lot. I mean, that's where I learned everything. So I was there initially as a college scout. So I had uh, had the Northeast area of the country and then the Southeast, I believe. Um, and then I got moved up to pro scouting where I was scouting our opponents, the advanced scout of teams we we're going to play and then doing free agency reports and that sort of thing and really enjoyed that part of the job. And then I was a director of pro scouting and then director of player personnel where I did more with the draft and um, you know, I had a chance to do a lot of work there and learn from some great people and get a chance to learn from, from, from Bill um, really on a daily basis. I was lucky. I always tell the people here, sometimes it's just location. Um, my office door was about, I don't know, 10 feet from Bill's door and about another five feet from his son, Chris Poyne, who was, who was the assistant general manager. Then he was the general manager when his dad was the president. So just a proximity, I mean, you're, you're seeing what's going on on a daily basis in the office and how things work um, beyond scouting as far as dealing with assistant coaches, dealing with head coaches, dealing with agents, dealing with the, with the league office, uh, contracts, salary caps. So, I mean, I just learned a lot um, just by being there, you know, trying to be a sponge and, and, and uh, pick things up. And, and I wasn't even anticipating being a GM someday. I was just worried about doing my job the best that I had, but you know, everything I learned really, um, really comes from, from those guys. And I, I remember um, hearing a story yeah, I think you told about um, one time, I think it was pre, it was preseason, it was the first game and it was maybe the Browns and Peyton asked you for uh, some intel on the, uh, on the Browns. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, uh, we were opening up with the Browns that year and I was in pro scouting at that point. And one of my advanced scouting teams was the Browns. So when it's the first game of the year, um, you can't do a lot of work on what they did last year because there's so many changes in personnel. So, you know, if you have that opening game, you can do a little bit of the first half of the first the first preseason game, maybe the second or third preseason game, but there's not a lot to do yet. But you do like to see them play a little bit in the preseason. Well, like first week of training camp, 
Peyton just grabbed me and asked me a specific question about their linebackers and what their drops were like. And I hadn't started them yet, you know, cause they hadn't played yet. And so um, I went back to my room and started looking at last year's stuff and um, to have an answer for him. The next day I grabbed them and I said, Hey, look, I got the answer. And he's like, I already got it. Thanks. And he walked away. So that kind of showed me one, like what his preparation skills are. They're, they're second to none. Um, but with him, like you always got to have an answer and be ready to have an answer at a moment's notice. So, uh, but I, I just thought that was just really cool. It just shows um, the level he took it to, um, to be as good as he was. And um, I can see he asked me other questions over the years and, and uh, I always had an answer moving forward after that. Tom, can I just ask you a question regarding this off season, and in particular how you've been very active in terms of recruiting players to your defense. Obviously there was the, the big, big uh, name signing in free agency. Uh, from the Patriots Jackson last week obviously you took a safety in the draft you've had the the Mac trade and um, was that with a view to how the defense played last year or more so around the fact that the division has gotten even busier in terms of Russell Wilson coming in and three quality quarterbacks with great offenses in the division yeah well you know as we finished last season and moved into this season um, I knew last year you know a brand new coaching staff new head coach obviously but really you know new schemes on, on both sides of the ball and certainly on defense, when you do change the scheme, that means that, you know, there may be some players you have that are really good players and might not quit or might not quite fit exactly what you're looking for. Um, but last year, you just, you can't flip the whole roster and, and you wouldn't want to either. I mean, some players you got to, you have to try and make, you know, make them fit in certain situations, but um, certainly on defense, we had to turn, you know, really turn it over a little bit, you know, certainly on the defensive line, there were just some characteristics that we do now that's just different than we did in, in Gus Bradley's defense. And, you know, I've seen this before, like when I was with the Colts early on, when we first arrived there, um, Jim Moore was the head coach. Um, Vic Fangio was a defensive coordinator. We ran a certain type of defense there. Um, and then when Tony Dungy came in um, as the head coach, and um, I believe at that point, the coordinator was, I think it was Ron Marlis, but maybe wrong. But in any event, everyone knows what you know the defense that Tony Dungy runs, and it's a lot different than what Vic Fangio runs. So we had to change the whole thing. And it took a couple of years to get the personnel um, changed over for that, um, just because Tony ran it a lot different than, than Vic did. So it's the same thing here. So, so it, but it also lined up in free agency where there were some players that we thought could help us because sometimes you have to turn it over, but then you go look who's available, and we're like, boy, there's just not a lot available this year. It's just the way it works sometimes, and or you may not have the the cap space to do it well luckily we did you know, we did have a lot of cap space so that lined up with the fact that there were some players out there Khalil Mack JC Jackson uh, Austin Jackson or Austin Johnson uh, Sebastian Joseph Day you know those guys can come in and, and and we think can really fit this really well it's hard to believe as well Tom you know, we're literally over a week out from the NFL draft it feels like it was it was on five minutes ago now and, um, you know, what, what were your thoughts on how the draft went with, you know, particularly in this first round when we had wide receivers going like sweets up until your pick? Uh, at, at 17, there were so many permutations that you could have went with. Uh, and you went for a guy in Zion Johnson. Uh, did, did you expect Johnson to be there at 17 at the time? Or were you surprised he was there? Uh, I expected him to be there. I mean, the, the, uh, the couple of weeks leading up to the draft, and I think every GM does this, but you do a lot of work trying to forecast what's going to happen in front of you and what's going to happen a little bit behind you in case you want to trade back. So, I mean, we do a lot of work in forecasting a mock drafts, just like everybody else does trying to figure it out. And for me, it doesn't always necessarily mean necessarily where a player, which team he's going to go to, but just, is he going to go before us or not? You know, so we're prepared. Um, in this case, with all the work I did, I felt pretty confident he would he would be there. Um, but when when the Texans took uh, Kenyon Green at that spot, that's when I started to get a little nervous because I thought Kenyon Green would go after us and he didn't. Um, and I also thought with with Houston, I knew they had a need there, but I thought they were going to go a different direction, but they didn't. So um, when we got to our pick, I mean, I did have some thoughts of possibly trading back a little bit. Um, but when Kenyon Green went off. And a couple, there was a couple teams, a couple picks after us that I knew had an offensive line need. And I don't know necessarily know if they even liked our guy or if they would take that position. I, you know, you don't know. You just kind of make educated guesses. But um, in the end, I just to stay put, take the guy that we like, and I move on from there. But it was a. The other interesting thing was like you guys saw, like you know, no quarterbacks win. Those are usually pretty easy to fill in. Um, 
But in all the work we did, we did all the work thinking, all right, let's do it pretending no quarterbacks go in the top in front of us. Um, and if a couple go, great, that would help us out. But if they don't, we'll be prepared for that. Tom, some teams like my own Broncos struggle when drafting quarterbacks. We acquired them in other ways. But the, the Chargers have an amazing history, right? Fouts, Breeze, Rivers, and then obviously now Justin Herbert, um, who, who you um, were selecting. Um, I think what would be really interesting for fans um, here and probably everywhere would be kind of to get some insights into the evaluation process. I know with Herbert, the, the senior bowl played a, a role, and, and we've been very lucky. We can um, call Jim Nagy a friend of the show. He's been on with us three or four times, and he talks about like and the, the senior bowl and the exposure that teams get to, to guys down there. But can you talk to us, I suppose, about what, a, as a GM, and you obviously have your scouting experience, what are the traits you look for? What's the evaluation process when you are you know that you're going to be taking a QB and it's going to be somebody pretty high up in the way in which you took Justin? Yeah, you know, the, the first thing, and, um, you know, I've been lucky. I mean, most of my career, it's been, you know, I was Peyton Manning my whole career in Indianapolis and Andrew Luck for one year. So, I mean... Those are pretty high level quarterbacks, obviously. And then I come to the San Diego Chargers at the time and Phillip Rivers is here. So I've been really, really lucky. But you have to realize when you're scouting these college quarterbacks, um, they're not all going to be perfect. And, you know, when you're around guys like that, you just you just as you're scouting a college quarterback, you want them to have all those qualities that those guys have. But, you know, that's, that's hard to find. And don't forget those guys when they were college players coming out in the draft. I mean, they weren't perfect either. Like there's just no perfect players. It's not like this is a video game. So um, when we would go into this and we did this when, when Philip was here, cause we knew at some point, um, you know, Philip wasn't going to, going to play forever. We wanted to have a seamless transition to whoever the next quarterback was. So we were perfectly willing to at some point to draft a quarterback high and, and he just sits for as long as he has to sit and in, in, um, behind Philip just never really lined up with the quarterback that we really felt good about. And Philip was playing at such a high level. So, um, but when we're looking at these quarterbacks, we, you look at the pluses and the minuses, you hope the pluses outweigh the minuses and you hope some of those minuses you can work on. So, um, but I know with, in Justin's case, um, one of the things we really wanted to make sure is whatever quarterback our next quarterback was, um, we want to make sure he has some mobility to his game. Didn't necessarily have to be like Lamar Jackson. Cause that's just really rare. Um, but a guy that can, can move around, you can run a boot with them. Um, a guy that if, if it's third and, ten, third and 10, there's nothing there, he can go pick up 10, 11, 12 yards on his own with his feet. And, that, and that's the way this game is right now. I mean, defenses are very complex. So to have a quarterback with a little more dual threat, we thought something we'd like to have. So, um, so just to fit that criteria, obviously the, the intangible makeup part of it is, is probably bigger than the physical. Um, you know, you're the face of the franchise. You know, you're, you have to be a team leader. You have to be a great teammate. Everyone's going to look to you. You got to be able to handle the ups and downs as a leader of the team. And that is things you grow into, but you have to kind of see that at the college level. And, and Justin had that. And it helped that he was a four-year starter in college. So he was pretty mature, mature coming out. And then the physical ability of, you know, um, accuracy, which a lot of that is decision-making too. You know, someone who can process quickly, make quick decisions and accurate with the football. and Arm strength is important. You know, it's not the number one criteria, but certainly important. And, uh, you know, Justin has that. Um, but, you know, it's the most difficult position to me in professional sports to play. There's so much that goes into it. There's so much riding on it. So, and they're hard to scout. They just are. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been very lucky. And like you mentioned, the Senior Bowl, the great thing about the Senior Bowl, and Jim Nagy has done such a great job there, but it's a great environment to watch players compete because they're playing against other players who will be playing in the NFL. So even, you know, in the SEC and the Pac-12, um, there's a lot of talented players in those conferences. But again, not every single one of those players will be playing in the NFL. They're just not. Some, most, of those guys, most of those players will go on to work in other industries when they're done playing college football. But the Senior Bowl, it's good on good. Um, and it's, you know, multiple days we can watch a quarterback, you know, throw. Um, now, our scouts had watched Justin for a number of years. Um, you know, I've been, I was lucky enough since we're on the West Coast, I saw him live at least twice, maybe three times. So I'd seen a lot of him already, but it still was a great spot to see him, um, you know, interact with, with other players, you know, see if those leadership characteristics are there that we saw at Oregon and they were. Um, he was voted captain of his team, the senior bowl after just a couple of days. So that shows you the type of leadership capabilities he has. 
Um, but it, that's a great event and it's really good for all positions, but certainly with Justin, it was, it was a big help too. Tom, you, you've been quite consistent in taking running backs over the past few years in the draft. And yet last week in the fourth round, you just took Isaiah Spiller and there was a lot of, you know, I suppose scouts and mocks that felt that he would go late second round. Were you taken back and surprised by the fact that he fell to the fourth round? And was that, I suppose, in your thought process um, in terms of being a complimentary player to, to Austin Eckner, who had a really good season last year? Yes. Um, yeah, you know, it's hard to tell, especially at that position. There's, there's a lot of running backs in the draft each year, it seems. There were a lot of good running backs this year. Um, it's always hard to tell, like, who falls, what's who has great value. I mean, the, there's 32 teams in the league that the, that the league spoke, and this is where the players went. But sometimes you just don't know. But in his case, um, yeah, I kind of thought in his case he may go a little bit higher than he did. Um, but there was also, like, a pretty good running back group. But we think he fits us well. He's a pretty multi-dimensional back, and you see how we use Austin. You know, Austin's not just a running back for us. He's, you know, he, we can line him up at wide receiver, either outside or in the slot, and he can really operate very well in there. Um, Isaiah, you know, probably not as he's not that Austin like to put him out at receiver, but very good out of the backfield as far as running routes and catching the ball. Um, so that's a big part of the offense. Obviously, pass protection is really huge for a running back. And, you know, he's six foot, almost 220 pounds, and, and he'll continue to get better as, as a pass protector. But he's a nice all-round running back. And um, coming from the school that he played at and the competition he played at every week and was very productive, um, he can give us a nice nice little mix in that running back room. Absolutely. And, Tom, uh, another great Irish story might be in the offing for us uh, over the next season. We potentially might have the first Irish NFL player in 37 years. The Saints signed a punter last week called Danny Whelan, but also uh, woke up early on Sunday morning and seen the Los Angeles Chargers sign a kicker from Illinois who was born in Dublin uh, called Danny right. McCourt. So it's, it's good times for the Chargers. Potentially, it could be uh, the first Irish player for the Chargers, my first Irish player in the NFL in 37 years. No kidding. I didn't know. I, you think at the very least with all the soccer background that you would have a kicker or punter that would have made his way over by now, but uh, maybe James would be the first. He had a really good career at Illinois. He's got a big leg, um, very big leg on field goals and kickoffs, uh, really consistent kickoff leg. Um, he had a really nice senior year this year as far as a field goal kicker. Um, so he got a good look in camp. And um, the one thing we've seen with specialists, you know, certainly punters and kickers, probably more so the long snappers, but definitely punters and kickers, um, they all kind of develop at a different rate and different time. Um, I'm not a huge golfer, but it's kind of like a golf swing, trying to perfect that swing. So uh, James would get a chance to come in here, compete, um, and kind of see where it goes. But uh, yeah, so he was, I think he moved to the States at, at age eight. So he's, you know, true, true Irish heritage. His parents are, were born in, in Ireland and they're Irish immigrants. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool story. And James McCourt, everyone, not, not Donnie, my bad. Call him, go ahead. <laughs> I suppose um, kind of talk, looking at the way in which the, the game has expanded and obviously the Chargers have a big fan base here in Ireland, in the UK, in Europe. And I think you got to experience that firsthand when the Chargers played the Titans in Wembley in 2018. I, I think a narrow uh, one point victory that day. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, 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 I suppose the growth of the, the game here and yesterday we saw, you know, the league announced five games. So it's growing. We now have the game in Germany. Germany. Um, is it is it something um, drawing on the experience that you have had that you'd like to see the Chargers get out and uh, play an international game again in the, the not too distant future? Yeah, you know, I, you know, from a football perspective, it is really difficult, especially on the West Coast to make that trip. Um, you know, the time change, the jet lag, um, it's not easy. Um, but I really enjoyed the atmosphere. Um, I had a pretty long gap. Like we, when I was with the Colts, we played in a preseason game in Tokyo a while back. And then I, I had not been to an international game in a long time until that game in London. Um, and to see the passion for NFL football there, it was incredible. I mean, it felt like a playoff atmosphere just for a regular season game. Um, and we were out either Friday or Saturday night getting dinner somewhere and just walking around. And, and you know, a couple of people stopped me in this pub um, that I was just looking inside you know, wasn't drinking at all, but just looking inside the pub um, to stop me and, you know, say they were big Charger fans. And I mean, there's just the fact that someone would recognize a, a GM over in, in, uh, in London, um, you know, was pretty impressive. But it, the, the, uh, 
it was a great atmosphere there. And then we played in Mexico City, you know, after that. And, and that was the same way. I mean, the, the, uh, we played Kansas City there and uh, just a great atmosphere in the stadiums. So, um, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, I think it's worth uh, for your organization, for your club. I think it's worth it to do it, even though there are, there are some downside on the football side of it. But the things that we can work around. Um, and it was also good for our team. When we, when we went to, um, to London, we spent like three days practicing in Cleveland, which is on the East Coast. Um, so we could gain three hours before we flew over. So it was kind of like a little bit of a team bo team bonding event. They were all together for a week um, between, you know, Cleveland and then going over to London to, to play. And uh, it was a great experience. Plus, we, we won the game. So it always feels better when you win the game or when you fly home. But I really enjoyed it. I'd, I'd have no problems going back. Tom, it's been quite a hectic few years for the Chargers. Obviously, there was the speculation about moving from San Diego, which finally came came to pass. And then there was the kind of holding period in the StubHub Center before you've got to move to the new stadium. The pandemic is not too long after that. Are you finally find, finding your feet in terms of being in a fixed abode as the GM of an NFL team? You know what? Um, I really don't think about it, but when you put it, put it that way, yeah, I mean, it did like this was the first year in our new stadium with fans. And uh, it was awesome. Like you said, it's been a little bit of a journey, um, you know, the last, you know, four or five or six years. So, yeah, you do feel like you're getting your footing a little bit. Um, you know, this year, you know, with having fans for the first time in our new stadium since we moved, you know, from the soccer stadium and certainly since we moved from San Diego, I didn't even know what to expect, you know, in our opening game. Um, and the crowds were great. And to see this many people, you know, wearing Charger jerseys, wearing Justin Herbert jerseys, um, it shows us that, you know, we're building this the right way. And we knew it was going to take time. You know, when you move into a new city and a new market, it wasn't going to happen overnight. And it still hasn't happened yet. We're still working, working on it. But, um, you know, when you have a quarterback like Justin, um, and then when you have a head coach like Brandon Staley, and you see, you know, how we play, like our style of play, I mean, it's, it's exciting, to say the least. You know, we're, we, we go for a lot on fourth down. Um, we throw the ball a lot. We get the ball up in the air. We like, like to score points. And we like to play an exciting brand of football. Um, and that sells out here, and so, so do stars. Um, and you can do both. You can win and make sure you have an exciting football team. So um, it's been great. It's been. I do feel like we're starting to get our footing, and it's going to keep getting better every year. We were we were fortunate to have media pass to the Super Bowl. It's Super Bowl in that stadium. It's a fantastic stadium. Hey, are there are there stadiums in Ireland that are big enough to have uh, NFL games? Cook Park, uh, ninety thousand dollars, well, eighty five, eighty five. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so yep. plenty big enough. Yep. So if you if you want to come on over, we can yeah, maybe <laughs> with you two concert the night Better before and then and then the Chargers. You know what? Um, you're too low in the totem pole with me, but maybe you should contact uh, Commissioner Goodell and talk to Roger about it. We're plugging away at the at top. There you go. Good. Good. Here, let's do it. Uh, st state it against the Chargers in Cook Park. Try and manifest it. Tom, hey, look, I think you know, you're talking about Ireland there. The one thing we'll say in people in Ireland, in the UK and Europe, there's, there, there's a lot of Chargers fans over here and also thousands, hundreds, of thousands, millions of NFL fans in Europe. So so we really appreciate you taking the time coming on the show. We welcome on anytime and hopefully we'll get over to LA at some point over the next year again and, and relive SoFi again. Maybe at a Chargers game. F thanks so much for coming on. No, thanks for having me on. It was really fun. And uh, you guys asked some great questions too. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. Season.